On October 29, 2025, the Interstellar Visitor 3i Atlas reached perihelion, and what should have been an ordinary reddish-white scatter turned into something no coronagraph team had ever recorded. The object's envelope shifted to a piercing, electric blue, bright enough and coherent enough to make seasoned observers recheck their calibrations. Three independent solar sentinels, SOHO at L1, Stereoway ahead of Earth, and GOES-19 with its CCOR-1 coronagraph, captured the same thing from different angles. A sudden blue-dominant glow where comet models predict green swan bands and dusty red. For ground telescopes, the sky had gone dark a week earlier. By October 21, Three I Atlas had slipped behind the sun in solar conjunction, shutting down optical and radio tracking from Earth. That left the space-based network to hold the line. SOHO's LASCO provided broadband white light imaging and polarization. Stereoway's Core 2 offered the crucial off-axis view. GOES-19 contributed high-cadence color photometry. Their clocks were synchronized, their calibrations cross-checked, and aside from a few routine telemetry resets, the coverage was essentially continuous. When the teams aligned the timelines, the story that emerged was simple and astonishing. The green, carbon-driven aura that comets wear as they approach the sun faded, and a deep, broadband blue took its place, simultaneously in all three data streams. Why is that extraordinary? Because color is physics. Most natural bodies in the inner solar system, planets, moons, comets, radiate heat in the infrared and scatter sunlight in neutral tones. Thermal emission follows Wien's law. Hotter means bluer, cooler means redder. At 1.36 astronomical units, just inside Mars's orbit, the available solar power is about 770 watts per square meter. That heating can drive sublimation and brighten a coma, but it cannot push anything close to a blue thermal peak. A true blackbody at 450 nanometers would imply temperatures above 6,000 Kelvin, hotter than the sun, photosphere. There is no passive path to that regime at this distance. If the blue is thermal, the physics is wrong. If the physics is right, the blue is not thermal. That fork matters. Comets do exhibit blue features, but not because they're hot. Ion tails can glow blue through resonance fluorescence. Certain molecules, especially Co+, absorb solar photons and re-emit in narrow bands in the blue. In those cases, Wien's law doesn't apply because you're not seeing a hot solid or dust grain. You're seeing line emission from excited ions in the plasma environment. If 3i Atlas's perihelion blue is dominated by Co plus bands between NM, that would be an exotic but natural path. If, on the other hand, the spectrum is a smooth blue continuum with suppressed lines, the case for fluorescence collapses, and a non-thermal energy source comes back to the table. That is why the instrument teams aren't arguing about color. They're arguing about how the blue is produced. The immediate to-do list is unglamorous and decisive. Isolate lines versus continuum, measure polarization across the blue envelope, and check for an infrared excess that would betray hidden heat. So far, the perihelion data show three pillars that don't sit comfortably in the standard model. One, the green CNC2 signature dropped while the blue rose. Two, the luminous sheath expanded to roughly 300,000 kilometers with sharp outer gradients more like a shell than a haze. And three, the expected infrared bump from any hot dust remained modest. That combination points away from dust heating and toward a radiative or plasma process we don't yet model well at tilde 1, 3 AU. Color isn't the only anomaly in the ledger. Start with geometry. Interstellar arrivals normally cut through the planetary plane at steep angles, random inclinations from random origins. 3i Atlas slipped in almost coplanar, within about 5 degrees of the ecliptic. On paper, that can happen, but the odds are long. Next, kinematics. Material has been recorded ejecting sunward, a direction the solar wind and radiation pressure should suppress. Antitails can appear in rare projection geometries, but repeated episodes of narrow, sunward-directed flow at this distance are not standard. Chemistry adds another fracture line. Multiple reductions show nickel vapor without the expected iron companion, an inversion of the usual nickel-to-iron ratio seen in primitive bodies. And volatiles, water, normally 80-90% of cometary ices by mass, 
looks to be only a few percent here, with Ko and Ko2 taking the lead. Each point has been independently rechecked. Each remains. Then there's the brightness evolution. Typical comets brighten as solar heating ramps up and then ease post-perihelion fatting as they recede. Three eye atlas surged. The blue envelope didn't just brighten. It ballooned with a near-uniform intensity profile across a vast shell. If that envelope is ion-dominated, you expect structure. Streamers, kinks, sector boundaries shaped by the interplanetary magnetic field. What we see, at least in coronagraph reconstructions, is surprisingly coherent. Either the shell is being replenished at a rate and geometry we don't expect, or we're watching a plasma interaction tuned by conditions we haven't modeled. A third option sits quietly in the margins of internal notes. Active energy deposition, non-passive, non-thermal, sustaining the blue luminosity without the telltale heat. All of this would be easier to parse with the very high resolution. Multiband packet goes 19 captured on October 2. Those frames remain withheld pending, sensor calibration review. The scientific case for rapid release is straightforward. Independent teams need the raw counts to separate narrow co plus bands from any wide, continuum-like glow. The policy case is more complicated. National technical means calibrations ride alongside the imagery. For now, the debate over declassification has become part of the 3 i Atlas story. Transparency versus provenance. Public trust versus pipeline security. While the blue stole headlines, dynamics quietly raised stakes. As perihelion approached, orbit solvers began to pick up non-gravitational acceleration beyond what the visible anti-solar outgassing could explain. Think of each vent as a micro-thruster. If the thrust is off-center, the nucleus should torque. If it's asymmetric over a rotation, the path should drift in characteristic ways. Some of the measured residuals came in stepwise, not smoothly, brief measurable nudges that shifted the projected trajectory more abruptly than expected. Fragmentation, changing spin state, a moving center of mass, all are on the table and all are testable if we can watch as the light curve cadence, the jet morphology, and the astrometric residuals together. And then the envelope turned blue. Critics will rightly point out that comets can look blue without breaking physics. That's true. The question is which blue? A fluorescence-dominated spectrum will be line-rich, strongly polarized and coupled to the solar UV field in predictable ways. A continuum-like blue with weak polarization, a sharp outer boundary, and little IR is something else. That something else is why the December 19 window matters. On that date, Hubble and JD will coordinate. Hubble will map visible UV lines and polarization. JWST will chase mid-IR heat, hunt for unusual slopes, and look for structured features that don't match dust or CO2 alone. Precision astrometry will watch for post-perihelion course changes not aligned with the visible vents. Radio facilities will listen for any narrowband emissions that vary with geometry. None of these tests require speculation. Each produces a yes-no. There is a second layer to the plan that hasn't been glamorous but might be decisive. Scattered light color ratios across the shell as the phase angle changes. If the blue envelope is plasma, color ratios should track the solar wind regime and magnetic sector crossings. If it's fluorescence, they'll track solar UV index and molecular lifetimes. If it's active power, thermal management, directed energy, or any engineered output, the color ratios will decouple from those environmental drivers and hold steady across conditions where they shouldn't. Outside the big observatories, citizen astronomers are doing real science. High cadence photometry can detect micro periods in the light curve, clues to shape and spin. Amateur spectrographs can still pick up strong CN and C2 bands and test whether the green component remains suppressed after perihelion. Coordinated observations across longitudes can close gaps professional facilities can't. Open ephemerides from the minor planet center, let small teams watch for reacquisition timing drift. If 3i Atlas shows up late by tens of arcseconds, that matters. None of this escapes the broader context. The approach vector lies within a few degrees of the sky region of the 1977 WOW signal. On its own, that is trivia. 
In an anomaly ledger already carrying low inclination, sunward ejection, nickel-rich iron poor vapor, water scarcity, stepwise accelerations and the perihelion blue, coincidences acquire weight. They do not prove. They prompt tests. So where does the debate stand? Three hypotheses share the field. Unknown natural process. A co- and co-2 dominated interstellar body, formed in a cold, carbon-rich nursery, is producing intense co plus fluorescence in a plasma sheath under conditions we haven't modeled at tilde 1, 3 AU. Test. Line-rich blue spectrum, strong polarization, environmental coupling, modest IR. Rare but natural outlier. The object sits at the tail of known distributions for inclination, chemistry, vent geometry, and non-gravitational forces. A stack of improbables that, taken together, still sum to nature. Test. Everything matches known physics when errors and projection are fully accounted for. Nothing requires new mechanisms. Technological origin. Engineered materials, active heat or power management, deliberate ejection patterns. Test. Continuum like blue without lines, weak polarization. IR excess inconsistent with solar input. Abrupt non-random trajectory adjustments structured radio emissions or surface reflectance that implies tuned albedo rather than dust. There is no need to pick a winner by argument. The sky will rule. Between now and the December window, teams will re-reduce the perihelion data, run laboratory fluorescent spectra of Co plus under solar analog excitation, and simulate plasma shells at 1.3 AU with realistic field geometries. If the blue is line dominated, you'll see it. If it's continuum, you'll see that too. If the object is steering even slightly, you'll measure it. That's the discipline. That's the point. What we can say, cleanly and without drama, is this. On October 29, 2025, an interstellar object displayed a blue-dominant envelope near the sun that no standard thermal model can explain. Its path is unusually flat. Its ejection behavior includes sunward flow. Its chemistry is nickel-heavy and water-poor and its perihelion brightening produced a coherent shell a quarter the sun's diameter without the infrared signature a heated dust cloud should show. Those are observations. They are reproducible. They demand targeted tests. Maybe 3 I Atlas just taught us a new chapter of comet physics. How carbon-rich interstellar bodies couple to the heliospheric environment in ways our textbooks don't yet capture. Maybe it taught us something stranger. That not everything luminous near the sun is merely hot dust and gas. Either way, the lesson is the same one the sky has given us for centuries. Look carefully, measure honestly, and let the data decide. Because if a visitor can turn the color of physics blue at the edge of the sun and get away with it, the universe is either more natural than we imagined, or more inhabited. And in both cases, we're not done watching.